did an excellent job. So we'll get things underway. As we mentioned, Skylar Karinji in the red. She's from Earlton, New York. Wrestles for Cooksacky Athens. Big throw! Puts Grace Stem on her back. Grace Stem from Bald Eagle Area High School, Snowshoe, Pennsylvania. She's in big trouble right now. As Karinji comes off her, her national anthem performance and follows it up with possibly a better performance. She's it puts them on her back. She steals my thunder a little bit. And my scouting report, right side underhook, left side two on one. She went double underhooks, big headlock up over the top. Oh, uh... and she comes with the left side collar, causes problems for her opponents as most are uh, familiar with a right side collar tie. So Stem needs to start obviously building her way back into this match, trailing five to one. A takedown here would go a long way into climbing back into this one. Turnchy sixth in Fargo Junior last year. Great Stem, a cadet world team member. Oh, jeez, man. Stem is splitting the legs, and Karinji showing some tremendous amount of flexibility that I think would have broken most people's necks. She is super flexible as she was able to fight through that position. So Grace Stem in control on top with under 10 seconds, and a ride out would be big for Stem here. So Karinji starts off with the fireworks, goes up 5-0, and Stem able to battle back with the escape and the takedown to make it 5-3 headed into the second period. And it's always interesting with uh, the female competitors. Nice shot by Stem just to see uh, how their mat wrestling is. You know, uh, some girls are used to wrestling against the boys where they're wrestling a folk style. Um, some girls are used to wrestling other women and do freestyle. And when you get down on the mat, you can usually see a huge difference between what they're used to wrestling. And Karinji, just guessing, being from New York probably wrestles a little bit more of the freestyle schedule. Grace Stem has committed to wrestle for Lock Haven. As the women's sport has been gaining momentum. Yeah, she'll be wrestling for Ronnie Perry there at Lock Haven. The recently added women's program. They've, they've had women in the Lock Haven program for years. Back in the late 90s, early 2000s, Sarah McMahon, a Olympic medalist, coming out of the Lock Haven program. And Karinji trying to hang on to the leg as Stem trying to find a way behind. We'll see if she can. She's trying to attack that leg and pull it up to possibly work in a near side cradle, but referee didn't think there was much improvement happening there, so calls a stalemate, and we've got 35 seconds to go in the second period. So, so far, Iowa really the biggest program, the only big program, so to speak, that has, has committed to adding a women's program. But you know when Iowa made that decision, it's going to really, I think it's going to open up the floodgates. I'm sure in the next year or two, we're going to see some other big name programs add the women's sport. And you have Sacred Heart, uh, Presbyterian, Arizona State, you got to think, has it coming whenever you get commitments from recruits like the Blade Sisters. Yeah, they're going to uh, want to wrestle. They're yeah, they're going to want to wrestle. There, there's some type of plan in place they just haven't rolled out yet. So Stem will have choice in the third. She's gonna go underneath. There you see 
Karinji, not real comfortable with the mat wrestling, just wants to go neutral and gives the point to Stem. So Karinji, he's got to try to get back to those upper body holds that gave her that success in the opening sequence of the match. And it's when Stem's looking for the left side collar, Karinji, and she takes a two and one off on the opposite side that she normally does. Stem trying to build up out the back in good position to finish as Karinji not grabbing either ankle. Stem able to come through. And she's been able to dig herself out of that five point hole and she finds herself up eight to six with a minute 20 to go. David Taylor, your Hall of Fame inductee, Karinji. Looks like she's gonna be out for the escape. And as I say that, Stem able to recover on top to a Merkel. But David Taylor in his speech, he said, hey, I, I had the option. I could go with Team USA, I could go with Team Pennsylvania. Grace Stem, one of those M2 training center wrestlers in tonight's main event card for Pennsylvania made the decision easy for David Taylor to go with Team Pennsylvania. Too near fall on the board to extend to 10-6. You can also see Mark McKnight over there. Yeah, Coach Mark McKnight, a big uh, a key to the M2 training center as David Taylor obviously has a very busy schedule. I've heard though he, he is oftentimes at, M, at the M2 training center, but Mark McKnight does an excellent job developing the young athletes. And I was just gonna mention me, before you started talking there, Stem looked over at the corner with that side headlock and they were saying, just wait for the stalemate, but it kind of fell into her lap as far as picking up those two near fall. And she'll go up 10-6 with under 20 seconds to go. So a great match to get things started. Again, I just gotta mention it one more time. Very impressive by Scholar Karinji. With that awesome national anthem, comes out with a big throw, but just grace stem too much. Ranked number three in the country in folk style wrestling, a folk style national champion. Grace Stem headed to Lock Haven next year, picked up the win for Team Pennsylvania. Get things rolling with the boys. And we're gonna start off with 120 pounds. We have Joey Cruz from Plain West. And from, uh, I'm sorry, I messed that up already. He's from Sanger, California. He gives up the takedown to Mason Leapart from Dover. And this is where Leapart is so tough. And this is a surprise already. Cruz a big favorite in this matchup. Anytime you look at Pennsylvania pulling the upset, you have to circle a couple matches. This is one I had circled. I said if Leapart can get to a cross wrist, he could pull the upset over Cruz. Cruz ranked number one in the country, but that's down to 113 pounds. Leapart third and second, a four-time PIAA state qualifier. And I can tell you right now, Cruz has never felt this kind of pressure with a cross wrist tilt. I mean, I'm just telling you, Lee Park is one of the best around with it. He gets that wrist and he can really open up a match. Joey Cruz, a great rivalry in California with Richard Figueroa. Figueroa upset by Brett Unger in last year's Classic. Lee Park, just so clingy, just really strong. And you can just tell, incredible grip strength. And you can see in this position as he's hanging on in a little bit of trouble, but able to slime through it. Impressive exchange there by Leapart. And it's, we sat with Coach Kyle Sheftiga, Waynesburg. Uh, Leapart had a wild match with Matt Church in the semifinals in, in the 2021 PIAA Championships. Church said he was the strongest guy he wrestled. You take a look at Mason Leapart, you don't see it, but this kid can wrestle and apparently very strong. Yeah, and was mentioned Joey Cruz, as I tried to mention, but screwed it up. He's from Clovis North High School and from Sanger, California. Has a career record of 92 and 14, two state titles. Has committed to wrestle for Oklahoma next year. And he was third, second, and first in the CIF championships. His junior year was in a CIF championship. He finally got that under his belt this season. We part from Dover, Pennsylvania. That's in York County. Career record of 130 and 12. He is headed to Franklin and Marshall next year. Gonna be a diplomat. And the other thing in the scouting report, Joey Cruz likes a head inside single. That's where Mason Leapart is very good defending. So whenever they get back up to their feet, look for that exchange. And it was Leapart the one getting the head inside single here in the first and a long ride.
Leapard had himself a great state tournament. Came up short in the state finals, but really wrestled well. Had a great senior year. And he's used that cross wrist, as I mentioned, to really open up some matches. I believe it was a state semifinal match where he picked up three near fall. And that's what really was the key to victory and got him his trip to the state finals in Hershey. Knee part gets extended on a shot, able to hang on the elbow, tries a dump, along with that knee tap, unable to get it going. In the press conference, Joey Cruz said, I want to set a high tempo. I really want to wrestle at a high pace. He's good in this front head to a go behind. Throws it up over the top. Cement job position, but Lee Parts hands down, take down for Cruz. And you see the flexibility there from Lee Part. I mean, that's gonna, it's a lot of shoulder pain there, but able to just throw that over to get out of the hold originally, but Cruz able to stay with it and pick up the takedown. When asked about his wrestling style, Mason Lee Part comes back with unorthodox. And uh, you, you see it there with the flexibility, really strong in awkward positions. And if you're Cruz, you just want to be careful here. Reversal is not something you want to give up to a wrestler like Leapart. Very few wrestlers in the state of Pennsylvania will even elect to go underneath him. And I'm sure Cruz is familiar. It's not like the old days where he had no idea about what guys have. Tons of video. And Leapart pointed to the trapped arm, he, you know, he knows the rules. <laughs> yeah, you can't lock your hands. Referee must have felt like he released them early enough. But the lift. Put him down with the trapped arm side. Five seconds to go in the period. Lee Park hanging on to the 3 2 lead. Short time to go. See if any wrestler is going to fire off attack. It's Lee Park who does. Takedown by Leapart at the end of the period. Savvy wrestling, and you get the feeling of the Pennsylvania team's magic here at the Pittsburgh Wrestling Classic in match number two. Absolutely. If Leapart comes out with the win here, uh, you can look back to that takedown right at the end of the second period, uh, the reason why. And going through. Matches I thought that Pennsylvania had to have right here at 120, Lee Part over Cruz, and the other one I circled, Vince Solomon, Caleb Larkin at 145. Yeah, Lee Part, one of the few guys on the Team PA that doesn't have a state title. On, Nolan Lear at 170, and then maxed out at 195. They're the only three wrestlers that don't have at least one state title. But you can see the state of Pennsylvania, you don't need a state title to be a, a tough wrestler as Lee Park earns the escape and goes up by four over Joey Cruz. Yeah, Lee, like, Lee Park doesn't want to give up an easy takedown here. You, if you give up the two, you at least want to burn some clock. And look at the foot position. Lee Park hiding the, the right leg underneath, gets to a crotch lock. If he can get that right knee underneath him, he's going to be in a good position. And good job by the referee of understanding the position that there's no control there by Cruz. Until so it's getting close. That's a good job by Lee Part. Yep. I think that's an excellent job by the official to hold that position. So Lee Part was wrapped around the back, grabbing the, like, the far kidney, I like to say, uh, and just doing enough to not let Cruz have control. I think a more inexperienced official might have thrown up two there, but obviously you could see that there was no control in that position. So you got to start thinking feet to back if you're Cruz. That'll be three takedowns and a ride out to close a four point deficit. And a guy like Leapart, he's not gonna gas hard late and he's tough to score on. So three takedowns is a lot to ask against a guy like Leapart. Leapart 
hasn't gotten a stall warning. So he's clean on stall warnings with 22 seconds to go and a four point lead. And it happens every year, the psychology behind this, when you see, you know, you, you get a big throw if you're Team USA, out the game in the first bout, Joey Cruz gets upset in bout number two. We'll see what Troy Spradley has to answer at 126 as, as the, some psychology comes into play. And there's our first star in our lead part, but does not matter as Mason Leapart comes up big with the win for Team PA. He's your winner, six to two. Mason Leapart, the big... And we'll move on to 126 pounds. Representing Team USA, Troy Spratley. He's from Oklahoma, career record of 82 and six. Correct me, Brock. It's gonna be Plano West, Texas. Uh, he's trying to write on my paper. I'm messing up. I have a hard time reading. So he's from Texas, 82 and six on the year. He's headed to Minnesota. He's taking on Jacob Van D, and we're scrambling. Van D trying to Jonesy tilt. Van D from Erie Cathedral Prep, hometown of Union City. He's trying to roll through and make it work. It's kicking hard. And this is a key position that Van D's very good at. Seen it throughout his career. And you can hear the crowd, they saw it coming. And Spratly able to fight it off. So Van D, Erie Cathedral Prep, Union City is his hometown. Career record of 111 and 23. State champion from Pennsylvania, headed to Rutgers. That is not correct. Yeah, I just read that too, and that's not where he's going. He's going to Nebraska, right? Nebraska. Yep. So, Spratly, an interesting prep story. Started out, he's from the Binghamton area, went to Wyoming Seminary to start his career, won a PA prep state title there. So you see his two state titles. One was in Oklahoma, one was a PA prep title for Wyoming Seminary. Uh, his dad's business moved around, moved to Collinsville, Oklahoma, Won a state title there. Was at Plano West for his senior year. Uh, was ruled ineligible this season. And he, he's talked a lot about his training and his improvement that he didn't have to worry about competitions. And, and just a year of growth as he's getting ready to head to be a gopher. Nice elbow post. Gets to the leg, Van D again with a closed wizard. And as you mentioned, Van D really good from this position. <laughs> able to get the two points right at the buzzer, so Spratly able to collect it. He's very close to gaining control, but was able to get it right as the time ran out. So Spratly up 4-1 into the second period. Van D, four appearances in Hershey, qualifier second, first, and fifth as a senior. Troy Spratley, a Super 32 finalist. Back in, that would have been fall of 20. Good future Big Ten battle. As we mentioned, Spratley to Minnesota, Van D to Nebraska. Nebraska has been plucking some Pennsylvania guys the last few years. I'm sure a lot of that has to do with assistant coach Brian Snyder from Easton. Able to come up here and grab some good recruits from the state of Pennsylvania. So Van D able to work up and get the escape. Trails by two. Halfway through the match, nice snap by Spratly. In my notes, pressure, stocks forward, very active for Troy Spratly, living up to that, you know, scouting report. Every time I've seen him wrestle, the kid's just gonna go forward, stock, put pressure on the entire time. Van D able to slow him down with the front headlock. 30 seconds to go in the period. Checking out Van D wearing those scrap life shoes. David Taylor, it's been a great guest this week and for the 
Pittsburgh Wrestling Classic was able to uh, really give some uh, nice talks to the wrestlers, really made himself accessible to the guys. Gave a speech last night at the banquet in the corner, trying to coach Team Pennsylvania. So that'll end the second period. Pennsylvania got it done. The Whippeal on the mat. Jacob Van Dee, it looks like he's gonna have a chance here on top. And it's traditionally when Pennsylvania is picking up big wins, they're the superior mat wrestler in this classic. As I mentioned, banquet last night. It's quite an event that the, the committee puts on here for the Pennsylvania Wrestling Classic. It's not just one dual meet. It's a whole couple days of activities as a lot of these guys are coming in from all over the country. So have a nice workout. Big banquet Thursday night. Today they had a chance to do a press conference. All those interviews are up on flowwrestling.org. Make sure to check them out. These guys here competing tonight. Best in Pennsylvania against the best in the country. And Van D trails by three, but in deep on a shot. So he builds up to his feet. We'll see if he can finish. Sits him to his butt. Spratley in the splits. Van D trying to get the second leg. Needs to get that ankle to the far hip now as he's in on the head inside single. Needs to take the right foot of Spratley to his own right hip, put it in the pocket. Good job of Spratley getting the close wizard, shutting the attack down with 111 to go in the bout. Looks like we're gonna stop for a little bit of blood cleanup on the mat. And we're gonna switch that over to red blood time, I believe. So we're gonna take a quick 15 second break and we'll be right back with you. So we're all cleaned up back to the middle. Both guys got a chance to talk to their coaching staffs. So they get ready to go with a minute 10 here to go in the match. So Van D is gonna need two takedowns and a ride out. Try to find a way to put Spratley on his back. At this point, Jonesy Till, that's where I see this head and if Van D's to win this match, Spratley going right in on the low ankle. Same position Van Dia needs to take the ankle to the far hip. He's gonna come up over top of it for a near side cradle. Yeah, Spratly able to lock it up and he's got Van D in trouble. Just briefly as Van D able to pop his head out. Spratly, hang on to that 7-2 lead with under 20 seconds to go. So impressive showing by Troy Spratly. Coming up from Texas, getting the job done. Mentioned this is a sure a big match for him as he missed most of the year. Exciting for him to get out on the mat and show what he's got. And it's Troy Spratley from Plano, Texas, with the win for Team USA. So they'll get on the board. Team PA up six to three. Also, it's in the building tonight. Got a inducted into the Hall of Fame. Well deserved, of course, but we'll move on to 132 pounds from Team USA. We have Zeke Seltzer from Cathedral High School, wrestling from Indianapolis, Indiana. Career record of 161 and three, three-time state champion, headed to Missouri next year. And he has Brandon Kletzos from Notre Dame Green Pond, from Easton, Pennsylvania. 
152 and 28. He's a state champion, and he is headed to Rutgers next year. Seltzer, a four-time finalist, three-time champion in Indiana. He's a good hand fighter, adjusts well uh, whenever he misses his first attack. His second and third option is there. And watch for multiple attacks out, out of a right side underhook. He likes to uh, throw it up to a high crotch. He'll throw by to a near side single. He said in the press conference he likes to be offensive. Kletzos, as I mentioned, hometown of Easton, Notre Dame Green Pond, District 11 also. Private school, double A. Oh, nice headlock by Seltzer. Going to get a 5-2 score out of the exchange. So the referee was throwing up the wrong points there, but he is going to say it's going to be 5-2 is the score. So two takedown for Seltzer, the back points, and then a reversal for Kletzos. And they must be using college out of bounds. And I forgot to just double check that, but <laughs> Klutz has only had one foot inbounds, and they gave him the reversal. And the PA staff, Coach Veers over there with David Taylor. They thought it was a two count. They thought it was only two near fall. Klutz was a four-time Pennsylvania State medalist on the double-A side, 6-3-2-1, where his finish is in Hershey. Describes his style as basic. Just a good fundamental wrestler. Double boots. Just saw a, a potentially dangerous call with that in. He's gonna ride tough with those legs. 28 and counting in period number one. Kletzos wrestling for Notre Dame Green Pond. They were the team champions in the individual state championships. Double A. Pennsylvania wrestled two weight classes. Dub, I'm not weight classes, divisions. Double A and triple A. Kletzos technically still in control. Referee's gonna wait to see if Seltzer gets the reversal, and he did. So Seltzer with the reversal late will make it seven to two. A lot of points put up on the board here in the first period. Seltzer decides just to push him away. Coaching staff is telling him no reversals, and he decided just to make sure there was no reversals as he just pushes Kletzos away and gives him the escape, and it makes it seven to three. in the 48th annual Pittsburgh Wrestling Classic. Used to be known as the Dapper Dan. A few years ago, they rebranded, changed themselves to the Pittsburgh Wrestling Classic. It's been going on for 48 years for a great cause. Helps out the Boys and Girls, uh, Boys and Boys Girls Club around the Pittsburgh area. Helps the youth wrestling programs. So not only a great event for fans around the country, but also the money goes to a great cause helps grow wrestling, not only in the state of Pennsylvania, but specifically in the Pittsburgh area. USA leads the series 28 to 18. One no contest, that in 2020, canceled at the last minute. Pennsylvania victorious last year. That was a 27-23 victory for Pennsylvania. Brett Unger of Notre Dame Green Pond, the outstanding wrestler on the Pennsylvania side. Klutzos, back-to-back -back appearances from a Crusader. And so many great sponsors here for this event to help raise money for the Boys and Girls Club and the wrestling program around Pittsburgh area. National Wrestling Coaches Association. Title sponsors, U.S. Marines, 
along with the Cliff Keen Athletic. Just some great sponsors here to make this a great event. And I'm going to even correct myself further. It wasn't back-to-back. -back. Sir Nigley was scheduled to wrestle in the 2020, so it's a three-peat appearance for uh, Notre Dame Green Pond with Sir Niglia Anger Kletzos. So not a lot of action in the second period. See if things pick up as Kletzos finds himself trailing by four. Gets set in the top position. Mike Moyer, director of the National Wrestling Coaches Association, in the front row right across from us. It's great to have him out here lending his support. He was able to give a speech last night at the banquet. Kind of a state of the union, if you will, the sport of wrestling. Kletzos anchors in with a double thigh pry on top. Able to slip a leg in. And Kletzos is running out of time to close this four point lead. So there's the stall call on bottom for forcing that potentially dangerous situation. Oftentimes that's what you'll see for a sequence if the bottom guy is just clearly standing up to get a, a stoppage for potentially dangerous. Most refs will give him one or two times, but after that they'll start hitting him for stalling. Again, difference in here. Can't just stand up or he's gonna get hit again and he knows that. It's just a different kind of game here in the high school as opposed to college, where college, they let them wrestle. In high school, as soon as they stand up, it's potentially dangerous. So you get these weird situations where, you know, Seltzer wants to stand up, but he knows if he does, he's going to get hit with stalling again. Kind of limits what you can do on the bottom position. We don't need to rehash our, our talk from the Pennsylvania State Finals, but I was, I I was just saying you. myself, I, I, <laughs> had, I, the rye smile, you're not I had the wry smile on my face. I didn't take the bait this time. I, I could go on forever about the threshold of wrestling. The, the potential dangerous call has to go up with the guys that are out there. These guys, you know, not, we've got number four in the country in Zeke Selter, Brandon Klatz was a Pennsylvania State champion. You can let them wrestle in that yeah. situation. But unfortunately, and I, you know this, but the referee can't, you yeah. know, because of those, whereas like in a power half, you can let it go. Poten you know, like most potentially dangerous situations, you have the judgment call as an official. In that situation, there is no judgment call. It's, it's black and white. You have to call potentially dangerous. And Kletzos is off the mat, but the referee is, then finally calls him out. We got some people behind me I, that see that as fling, and I can't I'm see on their it the side. same way. I, I'm on their side. Just because you stop once you're on the boundary, and I think Kletzos' foot was on the hardwood over it there. Was, yeah. I mean, everybody in the building knew what he was doing. He was finding the out-of-bounds line. And when that's the case, in college, that's stalling. In high school, that's a fleeing call. Technical violation, one point. So that'll end the match. Two wins in a row from Team USA to even things up at six. Zeke Seltzer. 138 pounds from USA. We have Jesse Mendez, Crown Point High School, Crown Point, Indiana. 156 and one career mark, four time state champion, headed to Ohio State, one of the big time recruits for Ohio State that we'll see tonight. He is taking on Briar Priest from Hemfield area. Greensburg is his hometown, 136 and 23 career mark, state champion, headed to the University of Pittsburgh. Mendez, watch his footwork, in and out step with the right foot. He likes to snap off of that. Briar Priest. A right foot lead, and it's Mendez throwing him through. He's gonna come up, driving across the legs for the takedown. But Briar Priest with, with his uh, lead kind of plays into the strength of Jesse Mendez. Yeah, Mendez with a nice little pancake. Priest able to get through the position without getting up any back points, but finds himself taken down again and trailing four to one as we go out of bounds. Jesse Mendez, four-time state champion, 2021 20, junior world team member. Two appearances at who's number one, picked up the victory back in the fall of 2020. 
Mendez, nice little knee pull. Head inside single. And Priest trying to cut back. Mendez ready for it as he picks up another takedown, third of the period, and goes up six to two. And he had that hand. It's not sure what angle you had on the, the video feed, but he took his right hand to the knee, keeping it legal. Can't go there with the leg. Talk about the appearances at, at who's number one for Jesse Mendez. He said in the press conference, he always wants to put it on the line. He embraces that target that he has as the number one guy in the country at 138 pounds. And, and you see that, you see him wrestle everywhere. He, not only does he say in press conferences, he goes out and does it. Yeah, one of two big time recruits for Ohio State. The other one, you know him, Nick Feldman, number one pound for pound wrestler in the country. Heading to Ohio State. He'll end things for us tonight at 285 pounds, but we got a lot of good ones before we get to that point. As Priest gets set underneath, Mendez gives him optional start. And Priest Closes it to a six to three lead for Mendez. Mendez, nice lift. What a transition from the front head go behind. Priest coming up to try to face Mendez, dropping in on the leg attack. And if you're Tom Ryan, you love those kind of finishes. There's no scrambling when you pick them up and put them down like that just in control throughout the sequence. Makes, it, makes for a real easy takedown call for the official. And Mendez does not stop until he hears that whistle. He likes to attack. Watch when Jesse Mendez puts that right leg forward. Priest shoots a knee pull single, takes an odd angle, it looks like a misdirection. See if he can get to it here as Mendez stalks forward with that right foot. You just saw him sprawl back. Priest touches the leg, but can't get the hands locked. It's Mendez going short offense. Nothing yet. Good hold by the official. Priest hanging on to the elbow. And Priest gets himself out of position, and Mendez is not going to let you get away with that. And I, I'm going to create a, a different reaction from Jesse Mendez. Briar Priest was looking for the home run one to go. Cradle kick him up over the top. And just the positioning of Mendez didn't let it happen. When you're out there in this type of match, Got to credit Priest for going for the home run. Yeah, that move's probably going to work on a lot of guys around the country when you're Briar Priest hitting it, but not Jesse Mendez. So we'll start the third neutral. Mendez with a nine point lead. Mendez jacking up the arm, putting Priest in some trouble. Picks up the two point takedown, does Mendez. Let's Priest go. Go back to neutral, score of 15 to 5. As Mendez sh shoots him off. And putting this into context, Briar Priest, the state champion, uh, knocked off Dylan Chapel for that state title. Chapel, a three-time runner-up, an overtime loss this year to Pearson Manville after Manville beat Tyler Kasak. So what you see Jesse Mendez doing is just this absolute dominance, super impressive against a tough competitor. And if you're an Ohio State fan, you gotta be excited about this performance. As you mentioned, it's a very dominant, what looks to be a, a win over a, an excellent wrestler in Briar Priest.
Priest still firing off the shots. Mendez looking for the bundle. Sets up his double. Goes up 19 to six. Mendez still in control. Priest grabbed onto the leg. Mendez can get some back points here. He could pick up the tech fall. As they come right into our table. Everything's okay. Don't worry, Mom, I'm fine. 19-7. Priest trying to preserve a bonus point here. Two takedowns for Mendez or feet to back. So Mendez picks up the two right at the buzzer. But checking my math, not a tech fall. 14 point win for Jesse Mendez. So he'll get a major. 145 pound weight class for Team USA. We have Caleb Larkin. He's from Valiant College Prep from Gilbert, Arizona. And he is taking on Finn Solomon from Franklin Regional, Murraysville, Pennsylvania. Record of 142 and 20, state champion, headed to North Carolina State. And we have a potentially dangerous in what was a really nice looking scramble there. I'll save it. This is one I circled, 145 pounds, Finn Salma. I think he has the upset potential. Larkin out of Valley of Prep, a, a private school. A lot of guys there, just, it's a wrestling school. They, they don't get to compete in the Arizona State Championships. They build their own schedule. They go to Super 32. They wrestle in Fargo. They, they kind of do their own thing and it really allows them to develop as wrestlers. They don't have to worry about competing every week. And Solomon deep on the attack, but Larkin in a good position to defend it. Caleb Larkin, to mention they gotta build their own schedule. He's found a way to do it because he's got a career record of 118 and 14. He's committed to wrestle for Arizona State and he's trying to slip in a near side cradle. Larkin ranked number four in the country. Solomon, a three-time state qualifier, three-time state finalist, second misqualifying as a sophomore, state champion a year ago, and dropped a, it wasn't a rubber match because he had a 2-0 or 2-1 lead on Ty Waters in the matchup, so it ended up 2-2. Waters getting a state final after those guys battled throughout the season. And Solomon just being tough right now with 20 seconds to go in the first period. And he toughs out the position and, and earns the stalemate. You don't often say that, but that's a position where you really have to work to get that stalemate called. And Solomon tried to throw him by, but gave up the whole right side of his body as Larkin able to collect the takedown right at the end of the period. We'll see if he can ride him out. That, that was great technique by Larkin. He, he knew he was beat on the throw by, goes back hand to the heel, cross heel. Brings Solomon back for the takedown. And Larkin does a nice job of staying deep across the back in order to get that escape. Typically, well, the way you should call it is when the top guy, when his arm goes across the backbone. So if his hand is across the back, across that backbone, they're not gonna give an escape point, or they shouldn't. Um, and that's where Larkin was. He was completely across the back. So no escape for Solomon. Big ride out for Larkin to end the period of Solomon. Creates some motion and gets the reversal. I was going to say how important that toss win was for, for Larkin. He got to defer his choice down the line. But Larkin able to get the reversal. Talking to Matt Levy throughout the season about this matchup with Waters and Solomon. He said, Finn, I think he has more reversals than escapes. It's just a knack for it on the mat. He's tough on top of the crab right half. See if he can put himself back in that position as Larkin got the reversal right back. Larkin, you, I think you'll see him look for a cross wrist. He's pretty proficient in that position. 
Solomon comes up to his feet and Larkin didn't even re attempt a mat return, just pushes him away and wants to get back on the offense. Solomon, fireman's carry, great job by Larkin of just sagging hard. Good wrestling by both guys. Solomon getting back to a wizard that was almost initially started to go up over top of the head. He got to the wizard, able to fight the position, square up and stay neutral. I just got a feeling we're like a second away from either one of these guys getting put on their back. Solomon working through the position and picks up a two-point takedown right near the edge. And excellent wrestling by Solomon. It's going to sound like hindsight here in my notes. High-level scramble, attacks ankles well from defensive position is my notes on Solomon. We just saw it there for a takedown. Huge ride out here with just four seconds remaining. So big second period for Solomon. Looking over at the USA staff, Cliff Fretwell is the honorary coach. You get Eric Larkin, a four-time All-American at Arizona State, 4 3 2 one at Arizona State, and you have beside him Angel Cejudo, the coaches at Valiant Prep. And we should mention Cliff Fretwell, not just an honorary coach, like he doesn't know what he's doing. He's an excellent coach down in the state of Georgia. Wrestles, uh, uh, has a really nice club down there, compound wrestling, does a great job down there. So honorary coach made the trip up with... Uh, Matt Singleton. That's the name was slipping me for a second, but came up with Singleton from Georgia. Solomon, there's that position again, has the elbow. We'll see if he can force a fireman's carry. I guess it's more of a dump when you're already on your knees. But he's got to be careful. Larkin really did a nice job of sagging that last time and almost caught him on his back. Mentioned in the undercard, several guys in the lineups tonight, both in the undercard and the current match. Guys going to NC State. This is one of them, and Finn Solomon be followed by Arrington next, also going there. Solomon comes behind, has rear standing, and puts him down for the two-point takedown. And that's a huge takedown that might just ice this thing. You're five minutes and ten seconds into the mat. You have to come up with a big lift. Solomon dug deep and got it. And that's just a difference right there between high school and college. In college, you get a hand touch, even graze the mat. That's going to be two, because he already established rear standing control. In high school, it's more than that. you got to put him down, and he put him down hard. And now he's got a bar, and Larkin is flattened out, and Solomon's in really good shape. He's got to just stay, look busy on top right now. 120, 145 were matches that I had circled for Team PA. It looks like they're going to get both of them headed into a couple rubber matches. So big win by Team PA, stops the momentum of Team USA, who just rattled off three straight wins. And Pennsylvania comes back, so it's three bouts to three. The difference is bonus points for Team USA as they hold on to a, a one-point lead. And Finn Solomon from Frank. And this is the match I'm looking forward to. <laughs> and so is Hunter Garvin. Gets a caution before we even begin, and I'll start with Hunter. So Hunter Garvin, 152 pounds from Iowa City West High School, Iowa City, Iowa, obviously. 142 and seven career record, three-time state champion, headed to Stanford to join the Cardinal. Not Hunter, Cardinals, Cardinal. Hunter Garvin, a right foot lead. Left foot on the line means a low single on the whistle is coming. He beat me to it there uh, before the match even got underway. Look for him to control the right side elbow. Very good in an overhook position. And it's usually Jackson Arrington who is attacking first. Jackson Arrington representing Team PA from Forest Hills High School. As Garvin tries to power in, he's from Forest Hills High School, 146 and eight career mark, three time state champion, and he is headed to NC State as he tries to slip a leg in on the far side, doesn't have it in yet. Good hold by the referee. We saw this exact position, the who's number one match. And I can't remember how it was scored on the boundary line. I believe there was a brick thrown by Coach Strip Matter for Arrington that took a takedown away. That's exactly correct. It was called a, called two. Was wiped off the board. 
Arrington, there's that fireman's carry that he hits. We'll see if he can pop his head. He does and picks up the two point takedown. Arrington's gonna hit a variety of attacks. He has an unmatched pace and gas tank. He took the match on short notice at who's number one. See if that makes a difference here at the Pittsburgh Wrestling Classic as he knew full well and just coming off a state title two weeks ago. Yeah, I believe he only had a week's notice before he took on Garvin. Won the match, I believe 3-2 was the final. Garvin didn't have a takedown in the match. His points were off of an escape and then a stall point on some, say some questionable stall calls on Arrington in that match. But Arrington known around Pennsylvania, well around the country, but around Pennsylvania especially, just a point scoring machine. Just ran right through the bracket. The Pennsylvania State Tournament. Really nobody even putting up a match against Arrington. Got Coach Sheftick in between two Penn State All-Americans with David Taylor on his right. Jake Strayer, the head coach of Forest Hills on his left. All-American for the Nittany Lions. Back in the pre-Kale Sanderson days, which if anybody can remember that. Arrington able to stay with him. Arrington, I, I don't really see a weakness in his game. He's tough from everywhere. He's good on his feet, good from top. I haven't seen anybody ride him out. And, you know, an interesting addition to who's number one, they wrestled college rules, they wrestled a seven minute match, they had riding time. Arrington won 4-3 with riding time advantage, but the stall calls down the stretch were a little questionable, as you mentioned earlier. Nice what? little attack by Garvin. Right foot inside, cross pick. He takes the 3-2 advantage. So we're even with takedowns apiece, but Garvin on the attack was in deep, had the double, ended up in a single, and Arrington going close wizard. A lot of time on the clock. Arrington's got to fight this one off. Unable to do so as Garvin picks up another takedown and goes up 5-3. Garvin back-to-back -back takedowns, but this is the kind of match that Jackson Arrington wants. He wants a lot of exchanges. He wants a high pace. Arrington has the underhook with head position. See if he'll fire off a shot from here. One thing that I've definitely noticed in the last few years is, is how good guys have gotten from an overhook position. You know, it used to be like underhook, that's where you want to be, guys are going to fire off shots from there, but guys have gotten so good from that overhook position that it's not just a, a sure bet that when you have that underhook, you're in control. And the leg laced in, the hand came up pretty quickly. That's going to be close, but I think that was the right call because he did have reaction time. That's close. And it's, you know, Students of the sport, Jackson Arrington, you know, probably went over that position after who's number one, knows it lace in the leg in, but with short time, able to get that boot in. He's gonna be given the escape, and they'll, they'll start the third period, tied at five in the neutral position. A lot of people were looking forward to this rematch, and so far it's lived up to the height. Arrington and Garvin. Arrington comes in with a big double leg. He's in deep. Garvin rolls him through. Oh, what a move by Garvin. It sticks him. I thought Arrington was going to be able to put on the brakes, but got a little bit too aggressive in the position. Flying cement job. For Hunter Garvin, a Manville Tyler Kasak match from Pennsylvania State. But Manville was able to roll through in a similar position and pick up the fall. That one brought the crowd on their feet at the Hershey Giant Center. Not so much here in Pennsylvania. Yeah, that you as can, a hush falls on the crowd. You can feel the air come out of the Pennsylvania crowd here. 
everything was in line for a Pennsylvania upset. They need to get that win with Arrington. And now we have Levi Haynes taking on Aiden Riggins at 160. Yeah, we had a great match here. That one kind of just was a, a, a weird ending there. Not a weird ending, a great ending if you're Garvin. But at 160 pounds, Levi Haynes from Biglerville High School, 106 career mark. He was a state champion, headed to Penn State. He's trying to fight off the attack right now of Aiden Riggins from Waverly Shell Rock High School, uh, Janesville, Iowa, 171 and five career mark, two-time state champ, headed to Iowa. A future Iowa-Penn State matchup as Riggins continues to stay on the leg of Haynes. Haynes is trying to scoot the corner. I think he has a shoulder beat. He does have the shoulder beat. And Riggins does a nice job to improve his position. And you look at this matchup, you see three state titles between these two guys. A little deceiving as, as Riggins was third, second, and a two-time state champ in Iowa. Levi Haynes, state runner-up as a freshman, state runner-up as a sophomore, won a title as a junior, took this year off. He focused on training at M2 and uh, wrestling college opens. Picked up wins over Andrew Cernigli of Navy, Patty Gallagher of Ohio State in those opens. So, I, you know, a little deceiving whenever you look at the credential list for these guys. Cernigli, that name comes, comes up again, wrestled at Notre Dame Green Pond. Excellent wrestler in the state of Pennsylvania, and he's moved on to Navy, but yeah, big win by Levi Haynes over. Two-time NCAA qualifier is Cerniglia. Haynes, cadet, world team member, knocked off Riggins to make the team uh, two matches to one. And it's been talked about in the lead up, but those cadet matches are only four minutes long in their freestyle, so I'm not sure really how much you can take from those three matchups they had. And we'll find out who the longer match is gonna favor. But honestly, these guys at this kind of level, I can't imagine that these guys are out of shape at all. And watch. Watch when Riggins brings his left foot forward. Haynes steps over, but no control yet. Riggins has that arm through. It's a tricky position. So two for Haynes is called. It is a tough position. I didn't love the call. Tough position though to be in. You could see Riggins' hand was inside the body and honestly, if Haynes would have tried to come under the arm, he would have lost it. That's why he didn't. But the referee felt like Haynes was in control of the situation. So tricky call goes in favor of Haynes there. And it, it gets tricky there. There is a picture in the book like stepping over that back ankle whenever you had it down, whether he's on the leg or not. But some people get too much into that. Like they're like, as soon as you step over, like let's oh, do it right away. Like sure. no, it's not. You know, you, you can't just reach with your foot and get yourself out of position. Like I, that was a tough position there. Actually, you'll see that called both ways sometimes. Like sometimes a guy will barely step over there, no position of control, and a ref will call two. Other times, you know, they they don't hook the foot. You know, and then they're calling too. So it's a it's a tricky situation there. But like you said, Haynes came out the the beneficiary there. And it's a two two match with under twenty seconds to go in the second period. There's a position scored by Levi Haynes, going behind. He'll throw it by. Riggins doing a nice job controlling the wrist. Haynes run the corner, run the corner, run the corner. And he's going to go to a leg attack where I thought he was going to shuck it by. Double leg steps over the top, scores a takedown with short time remaining. Yeah, big sequence there from Haynes. And that's how you stay with it. I mean, if you're a young wrestler out there watching that, right at the end of the period, some guys will just be good with, ah, oh, going to the third, you know, it's 2-2, whatever. But he fought through that position, scored the takedown, and now he's in a really good position with two-point lead, bottom position. He gets his one, now he's up three. And this match mean, meant a lot, or means a lot to Levi Haynes. As you mentioned, didn't wrestle his high school season, so hasn't really been able to 
put on a show for the fans, show people what he's got. He wanted this rematch. This is the only match he wanted at this event when they asked him if he wanted to wrestle. He wanted Riggins and he got him. And so far, he's showing you what he, what he can do out there. He commented in the press conference that the less, comp less competition dates uh, was conducive to technical growth. He, you know, he's been putting a lot of training in and it just, you know, every once in a while hitting a college open, getting that high level competition in. And I think that's such a, a crucial point with, you know, practice, <laughs> you know, like it's good to get mad time, so to speak, and get matches in. But I feel like a lot of young wrestlers focus on getting the how many matches you get in the summer, how many matches when it's really like how many hours did you put in the practice room? You know, it's you spend a couple minutes out on the mat on a Saturday, but you spend hours in the room. That's where you're going to make the gains. And you can see Levi Haynes has spent hours in the room this winter because you can see the gains he has made. So Levi Haynes looks like he's gonna come away with the win, be able to get Team Pennsylvania back a little bit closer to Team USA after Hunter Garvin sucked the air out of the gymnasium. Levi Haynes does his best to get things going again for Team PA. So Levi Haynes with the, as we're moving on to 170 pounds for Team USA. Matthew Singleton from Woodward Academy is the high school. Moreland, Georgia is where he is from. 213 wins in his high school career, just three losses, four-time state champion, headed to NC State to join the Wolf Pack. And he is taking on Nolan Lear from Benton. Orangeville is his hometown, 145 and 22. And Nolan Lear will have his hands full, full with Matt Singleton one of the elite wrestlers from around the country, and but one of the best from Georgia. Singleton, a, a Greco World Team member, number one in the country, Nolan Leary, four-time Pennsylvania State qualifier, was fifth and third twice. Singleton with the opening takedown. And putting this in, in perspective for Pennsylvania, Matthew Singleton, beat Rune Lawrence and Rocco Welsh en route to a Super 32 championship. Those were your state champions at 172. Rune on the double A side, Rocco Welsh on the triple A side. And Lear obviously no slouch from the state of Pennsylvania. I believe he dropped a, a match at the state tournament to Rune Lawrence. Lawrence, just a stud from Pennsylvania, sophomore, two-time state champ. But Lear wrestled him tough. Lear, just one of the three guys on Team PA without a state championship. The other guy did pretty well, though, at 120, and that was Mason Leapart from Dover. He started the boys' action tonight with a win for Team PA over Joey Cruz. And Lear's trying to do the same thing up here at 170. Singleton, a little bit more accomplished, though, than Cruz. A little bit tougher of a task for Nolan Lear. Nolan Lear's brother, Corey Lear, sitting in the corner. He wrestled in the 2009 Classic. Team Pennsylvania won 30 to 21 over those All-Stars. David Taylor wrestled on the USA side. It's amazing when you look through the program here, how many NCAA champions compete here every year. If you look at it, it's like, Every year, it's between like five and 10 guys that won nationals that year are, you know, uh, were participants in this event. So they bring in the best of the best every year from around the country. Singleton really a three position wrestler. He's great on top, got out right away, good on his feet. Somewhere in this exchange, it's gonna happen. Lear's gonna take a shot. He's gonna go left hand drag and he's gonna run the corner with his right hand to the hamstring. So effective as he's a right foot lead. A lot of guys will, will drag with their dominant hand. 
So if you're a right foot lead, you like to drag with your right hand. He's very good at dragging with his left hand, which is the off hand, and then dragging to that right side. His hips are, you know, perfect position for it. So effective with it and scores often. Singleton, quick go behind to go up five to one. You have to hand it to the Pittsburgh Wrestling Classic Committee. They do a great job of bringing guys in from all over the country. And if you've ever tried to put on an event, you know how difficult it is to get people to commit, get them to come in, get them to travel. And the staff here at Pits uh, Pittsburgh Wrestling Classic does just a great job of bringing these guys in along with their families. Put on a great event. And they don't bring in uh, they don't bring in cupcakes either. They definitely pick the best from PA, but they're bringing in the best from around the country. I mentioned Pennsylvania pulled up the pulled off the upset last year against Team USA. I believe you mentioned they won 18 times in the 48-year history of the event. 28, 18, and 1. Now, 1 is not a tie. It, it was the no contest from 2020. As it's the 48th classic. It's nice to be in a venue like this. Peters Township High School, brand new facility. They welcomed in the Pittsburgh Wrestling Classic. It's a nice venue. I think it's a really good size venue. I'm sure some people are used to having it at the Fitzgerald Fieldhouse. Last year we were in the hotel ballrooms, so <laughs> a different feel, but I don't know. I like the size of this event. It's a nice venue. We got a packed house here. A lot of people enjoying some great wrestling on a Friday night in Western Pennsylvania. Get on Tim Rice along with Brock Height. Excited to be here tonight. Great competitors. Still have four matches left. Competitive team score as Team USA is up by four. But I'll be honest, that Arrington, <laughs> that Arrington and uh, Hunter Garvin, Garvin match, I think, was probably the key to USA victory. And lo looking down, Stout Rogers at 195, toss up belt. Pitzer Stewart, we saw the overtime match where Pitzer got the reversal at power eight and one. And then Feldman, uh, a heavy favorite at 285 as he's the number one pound for pound wrestler in the country at the high school level. And he's good for bonus too, you know. Like, and there, <laughs> there was a go bonus, behind. Yeah. He, he didn't quite drag with the inside, was uh, kind of on the outside tricep. Had a little bit of a hook there, got to the hamstring. Singleton just dominating and talked about his three, he's a three position wrestler. He's really good on top and it just dominating Lear in every position. It's only seven, two on the board. And he's got a great tan. And I'm gonna say it's probably natural. He's from Georgia, so he doesn't have to fake tan. Lear, nice little shot. Singleton with the most dominating 9-3 decision I've seen as he's in complete control but doesn't pick up any bonus. So that's going to make it 19-12 in favor of Team USA, but man, what a different team score. Clay Clayton Whiting from Oconto Falls High School, Oconto Falls, Wisconsin. 162 and five, career record, four-time state champion, headed to Missouri next year, and he is taking on Jack Waymeyer from Malvern Prep. Sellersville, Pennsylvania is his hometown. 110 and 27 career mark. He's a state champion, a prep champion, and he is headed to Columbia. Clay Whiting, a left leg lead, goes with the traditional sweep high crotch, double series from that left leg lead. Once he gets the legs, he's got really powerful hips. Took Abasad down to win the Luther Open. Just a big lift. 
off that attack. As I say that, it's Waymire with the head inside single. Yeah, Waymire did a nice job of jacking up that underhook. Was able to drop in on the leg and get the two point takedown. Waymire missed a large part of the season with injury. Wrestled at who's number one. He's ranked number five in the country. Whiting currently number one. And Waymire, the first of our two Malvern Prep wrestlers. As you mentioned, Feldman coming up a heavyweight from Malvern Prep. Malvern Prep has really put themselves on the mat as one of the elite prep schools in the country, say in the past three or four years. I mean, Nick Feldman's a big reason why. I mean, they have a ton of other excellent wrestlers also, but he's definitely the face of that program. Waymire, excellent wrestler. As you mentioned, missed a lot of the season, but another wrestler from Malvern Prep that we didn't watch much of this year is Caden Rogers, another elite talent. So you talk about a room where you guys got guys that can push you, and Jack Waymire talked about that in his interview, being able to drill with guys like Feldman and Rogers. And, and Nate Liner done a really good job with the Malvern program. And that... They're a prep school, but they're not a boarding school. Everybody's driving in. Uh, Waymeyer from Sellersville, Pennsylvania would have been a Quaker Town High School. They're, they're drawing those guys from District 1, and, and they're, they're doing it with, with local talent right around the school. Uh, Feldman from Quarryville, that's uh, Solanco District. Yep, they catch, uh, it's a nice, nice thing for Malvern Prep. They do have a train station right nearby, so I know a lot of the guys I know Rogers and uh, Feldman have been catching the train together for a long time, uh, quite a few years, heading down to Malvern Prep. Waymire hanging in control. There's a big one right out for Waymire. That's another thing you're talking about, you know, kind of local guys, and that's what Waymire kind of talked about in his press conference. It's not like they're pulling in guys as freshmen, they're like, hey, come to Malvern Prep. I mean, I'm sure they're getting some like that, but a lot of the guys in their program are working up through their youth program. They have a really good club program at Malvern Prep. You know, these aren't guys coming in from all over the country. And again, every good program is going to have a few of those, but most of these guys are from around the area. They wrestle at the club, and then they decide to come up through Malvern Prep, which is a great school. Clay Wayne. Saying his work at AWA with the Askren Wrestling Academy as a large part of his success really thinks that's a key to Wisconsin developing as a whole in the state. And also probably a key for Missouri recruiting as Ben Askren, a well-known alumni from Missouri. And Keegan O'Toole, AWA. Guy went to Missouri, won a national title just last weekend. Waymire tries that backstep standing Peterson that we saw in a previous match. He's very patient with it. Probably decided not to force that. So that was going to be the slowest Peterson I've ever seen. But I, I love the backstep there, trying to get to it. I can't even remember who hit it earlier. Yeah, I was trying to think too, and I can't remember. But yeah, well, it's just a little, little more explosive with it. Waymire a little too controlled. He gets the escape with 106. I love when guys hit that move in freestyle. <laughs> it's like so tricky. And that's where you, you can actually come up across the chest and really plant the guy. You can't do it in folk style, if, but if you can get that back step, really pop your hips, you can really drill a guy in a, a freestyle situation. And we're going upper body here with Whiting pushing in. Waymire backs out of the position. 40 seconds to go in the second. Waymeyer gets driven out of bounds, and we are back to the center with 37 seconds. There you see some differences between high school and college and college. Somebody's going to get hit for stalling there. And waiting just a little bit of a sloppy shot getting extended. Waymire tried to come around behind, but Whiting able to square up with him. And you gotta wonder if it's film work. Like the anticipation that Waymire has had so far with Whiting, it, does he know what, what's what's coming? Is there a tell, or, or is it just reaction as he's out there that he's been able to stay out of Whiting's attacks? Just thinking about Malvern Prep's room. I'm last year calling the Powerade with you, 
was an all Malvern prep final, I believe, wasn't it? Jack Waymeyer versus Caden Rogers in the finals of that tournament. It was after Caden Rogers had knocked off Max Dell. Whiting up to his feet, able to clear out and get his escape point. I'll cut it to a two point match. Little match strategy leading by two. You want to stay on the gas if you're Waymire. You don't want to bring a stall call into play. You get taken down, you have time to get your escape. And now Whiting's got the head in the front headlock, kind of a football grip. One hand on the chin, other over the head. You'll see some guys turn that into an illegal front headlock. They're very I sneaky when they do it. I love the football grip, chin hand down. You can protect yourself. If a leg attack comes, you can down block with the chin hand. Really work on stuff in the head underneath. Nice opposite side, high crotch for Whiting. And that shot, it, it's just so good. Like guys aren't used to fighting a head outside to that, in that position. I mean, it doesn't happen that often. I mean, I think of a guy like Frank Molinaro used to shoot the opposite side, head outside, and it, it's so deadly because guys, I mean, they know what to do, they're wrestlers, but it's just a different feel. It was the hand fight though, the tie for Whiting that set it up. Wayne yeah. Meyer wanted to go double overs, he, he slipped his arm out, dropped in the leg attack, down to 39 seconds. It looks like Whiting made the decision that he's gonna look for the ride out here rather than to cut in another takedown. And I was just gonna say, Waymire was actually in some trouble there. Whiting was pretty high on that Turk leg. I couldn't see it from our angle, but I'm not sure if Whiting grabbed the foot of Waymire to force that potentially dangerous, because in high school, you can't grab the foot. And the entire time Whiting was looking over at his corner, they, they were having a discussion with the side official uh, about the, the call, yeah. he decides to get the escape. He's looking for a takedown in the last 39 seconds. Yeah, I don't know how else that could be a potentially dangerous. So that must have been what had, what had happened. And now it's Waymire with a one point lead. No stall calls and 28 seconds. And it looks like the Malvern prep coaches are spinning their fingers saying, Skates. you better circle. <laughs> Put the skates on and circle. They're either pretending to mix a bull or they're saying circle like crazy. So there's the first stall call on Waymire. He can't give up another one or we're going to overtime, which I wouldn't mind. Waiting with the reattack, takes down Waymire. I think Waymeyer got a little tired there, ran out of juice. In the interview, Clayton Whiting says, I want to try to break you as soon as possible. It wasn't until the 550 mark, but he got it done. 5-4 victory. But three remaining bouts. And here at 195, we have Macklin Stout from Mount Lebanon. High school, he's from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 133 and 17, a career record. Headed to Pittsburgh next year, University of Pittsburgh next year. He is taking on Ryland Rogers, Coeur d'Alene High School, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho is his hometown, 115 and six career mark, three time state champion, and he has committed to wrestle for Michigan. McLean Stout, three time, or two time place winner, was second and third, injured his junior season. Yeah, we mentioned that a little bit before. He got injured in the match versus Caden Rogers at Powerade, missed his whole junior season. I, it wasn't against Rogers so, on the backside. Oh, that's right, yeah, uh, Mount, Montoursville kid. Uh, Krebs, I think, was the one in the match that hurt his elbow. Either way, he came back strong this year. Really tough matchup in the state semifinals. Dropped a tough one to Sonny Sasso from Nazareth. And he wants to come up big with a big win over Rylan Rogers, and he's on his way with the early takedown and goes up 2-0. And watch for Max Dowd. He, he can attack with either leg forward. So you see him switch up. He goes square sometimes. Really an odd look for guys. And he's really good at transitioning to an underhook, looking for the fall, almost pin Lenny Pinto 
with that in the state finals as a sophomore. Yeah, very good on top. Good from his feet. Just a really well-rounded wrestler. Rylan Rogers, cousin of Jordan and Chandler Rogers. He's gonna head to Michigan rather than Oklahoma State. But you, you hear Rogers, you know, he's got an assassin in his repertoire. Hit it in the state finals in Idaho. He's a right leg lead. Likes to knee pull and high crotch. Both finishes off the basically the same motion getting to the leg. And he talked about competing. He competes everywhere, high level, was at Blair Academy for a while. And he says, I, the reason I compete, it's, it's to evaluate, adjust, and get better. Yeah, I got a chance to interview him after his Ironman championship. I can't remember if it was sophomore or his freshman year, but just a great kid to talk to. So excited about wrestling. And that's, I mean, you could tell he wasn't nervous in the moment. I mean, as, as an underclassman at the Ironman tournament, one of the best tournaments in the country, if not the best tournament in the country, you know, not nervous, you know, not talking about anything like that, just being excited to wrestle and wanting to get better. It's fun to watch him develop throughout his high school career. Now you see him as a stud senior. Headed to the Wolverines, who just came off a second place finish at the NCAA tournament last weekend. Their best finish in quite a few years. Max Brothers both represented. I'm gonna stop there as we look at the action as Stout. Covering the far hit for the takedown. Kellen wrestled in the 2015 Classic. That was a USA win, 31-14 over the Pennsylvania All-Stars. He dropped his belt to Miles Martin before he headed to uh, Ohio State. Luke scheduled to wrestle in the 2020 Classic before it was canceled. He was an EIWA finalist this year for Princeton. And there's Rogers able to pick up the two points and makes it five to four in favor of Rogers. This will be a big exchange here for Stout. See if he can get the escape to tie it up at the end of the period. He powers up. Really good strength by Stout. Rogers able to put him back. That's a big mat return. We go out of bounds with three seconds left in the period. Mentioned so many NCAA champions that wrestle in this event, all Americans. So it's so fun to come to this event because we know these guys as high school stars. And most people around the country, if you follow wrestling, you know these names, but they're not quite household names yet. But in a year or two, you look back at this lineup. I mean, you just mentioned Miles Martin as wrestling one of the stout boys. You know, you look back now and it's like, man, these guys really go on to do some great things in the sport of wrestling, NCAA champions making world teams on the senior level, Olympic teams and winning medals for us. It's a name that stands out of it. I just glanced over at your program, you know, name like Gable Stevenson, one of the biggest names in wrestling right now. So we got an escape and that's gonna tie things up at five and Stout. Doing a great job. Mentioned he's one of the three guys without a state title, but nationally ranked in the top 10. Really broke into the national rankings, probably his sophomore year. You mentioned junior year injury. So even though he doesn't have a state title to his name, definitely an elite talent. He was in that 170 pound weight class as a junior that was absolutely loaded at power 80. He, he dropped a third place match to Pinto there and then uh, beat Trey Kaib in the semifinals at PIAAs, who was a returning PIAA champion. Sophomore year, yep. So we'll see who's gonna pull the trigger with one minute to go. That, that double leg he's looking for, blew through Sonny Sasso with it early before adjustments were, were made. And he tried to shoot through an underhook of Rogers and wasn't able to do it.
Good reactions by both guys. Got the crowd moaning and groaning as Stout comes in with a hard right hand club. He's got great position. I thought he was locked and he gave it up. We'll see what the second official says. He's gonna walk away from the situation. <laughs> we're in Peters Township. We're, we're in the Whippeal, maxed out from Did I mention Mount Lebanon. From Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, headed to the University of Pittsburgh. Maxed out, picks up the takedown with under 10 seconds to go. And he's gonna get it. Seven to five, maxed out. After the Arrington loss, you felt the air come out of the gymnasium. Look at this, Team Pencil. PA out of it, they are still in it. Pitzer, Dayton Pitzer from Mount Pleasant High School, Mount Pleasant, Pennsylvania, career record of 130 and three, three time state champ. Would have been four without an injury most likely. Headed to the University of Pittsburgh. He is taking on TJ Stewart from Blair Academy. From Triangle, Virginia, as Pitzer jacking up an underhook. Stewart, 121 and 16 career mark. He's a state champion, headed to Virginia Tech next year. Watch for an outside step single uh, from TJ Stewart, converted at Powerade with it. He normally lifts guys clear of the mat with Pitzer's frame. He wasn't able to do that, just went behind, dragged him down to the mat. Pitzer, 100 pins in his career, three state titles, just three losses. Uh, he likes a left side collar. Beats with his right leg. That left side collar causes problems for guys. Really good on the mat. Rode Stewart for a long time after Stewart. I thought, and there's the same type of step. Double leg, switch that's for a, Pitzer. That's a great hold by the official. There's the two. So good job by Stewart. Stewart got the takedown, the only takedown at Powerade, and he got in the first 30 seconds. Took him a little bit longer, but picks up the opening takedown here also. And you saw the, the mat work of Pitzer took something out of Stewart that he wasn't the same in overtime as he was in the first period. So this is another situation if your pits are weather the storm, get the match down on the mat in the second and third period, and, and then really, you know, implement some attacks later in the bow. As I say that, he's in great position with the double unders. And it looks like Pitzer wants to take advantage of this height advantage that he does have. And the way to do it as a tall guy is to jack up underhooks. And Stewart with the head buried in, almost hit the inside trip. It was there. Pitzer's gotta be a little careful. He's been a little maybe overly aggressive, just pushing him around with those underhooks. Stewart again, head buried in the chest, so we'll end the first period Big with a flip. one lead. Big flip. But you know what? We talked about it at Powerade, and then Stewart ended up choosing bottom, so he's gonna defer. Pitzer is going to choose underneath. And, and it was the same scenario. Uh, Stewart won the toss. Stewart to won the toss deferred. Yep. yep. And I had talked to Stewart earlier in the day, and I said, you got to go bottom on Pitzer. And he looked at me like I was crazy. He said, no way. And then in the match, third period goes, looks at his coach as they so down. He goes, okay. Obviously, it didn't work out for him in that match. And, and that was a 2-2. Two -two. Same scenario here. So Take we got one. Stewart. Escape, two escapes for Pitzer. Got a little excited on that shot. I wasn't sure he gave him one, and I thought we might be going one, then two, which would have been a big change in score, obviously. But just the escape for Pitzer is going to tie it up at two. So far playing out exactly like round one of this rivalry. And if you're Stewart, I think you got to work hard for a takedown in this period. You want to stay neutral in the third. You don't want to have to deal with the bottom position. Pitzer takes the leg that's there. Stewart comes around behind. I don't like the two there. He's got a cradle, but where's the control? Never took him to a hip. And it, it looked better positioning as they went out of bounds, but I agree with you. Yeah, typically you're gonna look for when that near side cradle's locked, you're either gonna knock him to the far hip. You can take him, you know, uh, over his head or back to his butt. Typically you don't want to go too as soon as the butt hits, but you want to let that roll happen and see what happens and see if there is control. Um, also get a little better angle. If you're the offensive guy there, the further you're out front, the less control you have. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, because then that lock starts going behind the knee where you really don't have anything there. But big takedown either way. And like we said, that's a big Stewart needed a takedown in that period to give himself the option, I think, to go neutral in the third. But honestly, I would have probably chosen neutral even if the score is tied, especially after what had happened at Power Eight. But who knows? I mean, Stewart has got to know if you want to be good at the Division One level, you got to get out from bottom. So I'm sure after that Power Eight tournament, you probably spent a, the next few months in the bottom position. And it's a situation where the hip power of Stewart must be overwhelming. That a couple times Pitzer's been locked on the leg and, and just felt the hips of Stewart and kind of bailed on the position. I'd be interested to see in Stewart really quickly. <laughs> Confirms with the coaches as yep neutral. What Stewart weighed in at, because I know at power he weighed in around 200 pounds. Um, Pitzer going up to heavyweight at college as Stewart in on the leg again. Stewart's done a great job from his feet on this mat. And this is where Pitzer's height is really the difference there. As Stewart lifted and his feet are still on the mat. Yeah, that, that was in the notes. He's, he's really good, powerful lifting from those leg attacks. Just has to adjust the strategy when he's wrestling Pitzer. And that takes something out of your gas tank, even if you got a big one. Trying to lift, and Pitzer jacking up doubles. So Pitzer has got to find a way to get to the legs. So far, it's really been only threatening with double underhooks, but hasn't really come close to converting that into points. And we haven't seen Pitzer on top. I think Brock mentioned 100 pins, got his 100th pin in the Pennsylvania State Finals. In on the leg, locks the hands. We'll see if he can drive through it. Tried to pop his head to the four hook, and I thought he almost had it. Stewart did a nice job initially. See if Pitzer can finish. He's got Stewart in trouble. He's got to keep those hands locked. Glances up at the clock. Stewart trying to find the out of bounds. Horseshoe. Are we going to see Horseshoe? We are going to see it. He didn't get it. Didn't really commit to that. He's on the second leg. That's not two yet. He's got to pull it back to the middle. Now Stewart in much better position to fend this thing off. Pitcher's got to try to throw that elbow down. Now it get out if I'm Pitzer. Is Stewart trying to hang on? Oh, and Pitzer had a little bit of a body lock. Thought he was going to try to go Adam Kuhn with the body lock and pull him back in, but it looks like Stewart is going to be able to hang on with three seconds to I would go. like to have seen more commitment to that horseshoe, a little more explosion. It's late in the match. These guys have been going at it. Easier said than done. So good match by T.J. Stewart and Dayton Pitzer. T.J. Stewart picks up the win, avenges his loss from the Power 8 final. But it would be 18 to 19 if Arrington would have won that match and not got pinned. And here he is, Nick Feldman from Malvern Prep, hometown of Quarryville, Pennsylvania, 136 and 15, career record. He's a two-time prep champion, headed to Ohio State next year, the number one pound-for-pound -pound wrestler, and that's a lot of pounds, but he's the pound-for-pound -pound wrestler, number one in the country. He is taking on Harley Andrews from Tuttle, Oklahoma, Tuttle High School, career record of 154 and 13. He's a three-time state champ, headed to Nebraska next season. And we've seen this Feldman Andrews matchup before, 2019, the quarterfinals, uh, U16, a 17-7 technical fall for Feldman, but Andrews got out to a big lead, was up 7-1, I caught a lace, Feldman clawed back in. A lot of protein eaten by these guys oh. between that match at 182 and where we see him today. I just want to comment about that attack, and I'm going to have to go and watch it again. Like, Feldman clubbed the back of the knee. Like, instead of clubbing his head, he clubbed the back of the knee and kind of collapsed the back of the leg and just ran around behind it. But that's just so much power from Feldman. And it's power with technique. And he, you're going to see a variety of tacks out of Feldman. Really good, a low single. Uh, he'll put the head in the knee. And he's, he was really 
specific about that. When I talked to him at the Clarion Open, I had a big win over Zachary Knight Ward, a NCAA qualifier for Hofstra, and he got stuffed on his first attack. And I said, well, was that an on-the-fly adjustment? He's like, well, hey, I, I work this in the room all the time. I know my positions, and whenever I get stuffed underneath, I, I know I need to get my head in the knee. Guys go down whenever I get the head in the right position. And that heavyweight from Hofstra is a big dude too, so you gotta stay in good position, and he'll have to next year. But he's looking to end his high school career. Got a little excited with the potential fall, but Feldman knew it was about the end of the period, so we'll end the first period. Feldman able to put eight points on the board. He is up eight to two and chooses to go underneath to start the second. Remember the first time seeing Nick Feldman, it was at, he was helping out at a kid's camp at Solanco High School down in Quarryville. He was a seventh grader, and he wrestled like a, a college wrestler. I'm watching him wrestle around in between sessions, and just so impressive. Just a super nice kid, great family. Um, just a top recruit, and Tom Ryan at Ohio State couldn't be happier, I'm sure, to get this guy in. Not just a great wrestler, student, but just a great face of the program, always has a smile on his face. He's the guy that you want to put in front of the camera and say, yeah, this guy's going to Ohio State. We talk about the dedication of these guys that go to the prep schools. You know, sometimes you'll hear, you know, a lot of times it's jealousy, but you know, all these guys that go to the prep schools, like, it's a commitment. I know Feldman, you know, Feldman and Rogers, they, they're from the same area and they commute a lot together down to Malvern Prep. and. You know, they're waking up early, catching the train early. They're going to practice. They're doing their schoolwork on the train on the way home. They're not getting back to their, their normal home until 8 o'clock at night. I mean, that's a lot of dedication that these guys are showing. And really, I mean, you can tell as a college coach, when you get a guy that can commit like that at the high school level, you know it's going to be good things when they get to the college level. Feldman with another go-behind takedown will go up 11-2. to two, And he just makes it look easy against everyone. I mean, it was a similar match when he took on the number two ranked heavyweight yeah, in the he, country at Powerade. He wrestled Jim Mullen twice this year, uh, escaped the Rock Finals as well. That was a matchup that he was looking forward to. Jim Mullen, uh, a cadet world medalist. And Harley Andrews won the title out at Reno Tournament of Champions, three-time state champion, 154 and 13. And when you have those kind of credentials and that pedigree, out of a tough Tuttle, Oklahoma program. And then you see what Feldman's able to do and how easy he's ma he makes it look. Yeah, I thought Mullins was gonna be a better match. Oh, Feldman catches him on his back. But Feldman just a, a freak in the nicest way possible. Nick Feldman caps off his high school career with the fall. Nick Feldman from Malvern Prep. He's headed to Ohio State. Look for him next year at the national tournament. A night of what ifs for Team Pennsylvania. Started out with Grace Stem, 10 6. Uh, in the opening bout of the night, she got tossed on her dome.